Part 5, Wave 3, 1890-1950 Chapter 11, American Shipping You don't understand. I could have had class. I could have been a contender. I could have been somebody instead of a bum, which is what I am. Terry Malloy in the movie On the Waterfront Like Longshoreman Terry Malloy in On the Waterfront, American shipping has become a bum instead of a contender. This happened over many years for many reasons, and policy has failed to reverse the trends. The American shipbuilding advantage was first strained in the 1830s when the British began to use their advantages in propulsion power know-how in iron and then steel production to build large, fast steamships. The British also started a mail contract program in 1839, a program emulated by the United States in 1845. Recall Brunel's construction of the Great Western. With the Brunel seated advantage, the British began to dominate the trades. The merchant marine developed two types of ships serving different markets, transients, or tramps, and regulars. The analogy here is to taxis serving various origins and destinations and fixed route services going back and forth on pre-specified routes. There were also a variety of ships, sloops, one mast, four, and aft rig, 25 tons, and schooners, two mast, four, and aft rig, 75 tons, were sailing vessels important in the coastal trade. Square-rigged brigs, two mast, 150 tons, and ships, three mast, 300 tons, conducted ocean trade. The clipper ship was the U.S. response to the British steam and iron hull advantage, a response that kept important market niches for the U.S. for some years. However, the U.S. Civil War destroyed the U.S. fleet, and by the 1870s, the U.S. had little presence in the maritime trade. Steps were taken to reverse this in the late 1800s. To build up the inputs needed for the shipbuilding industry, the Morrill Act of 1884 placed tariffs on iron and steel plates and on marine engines. To build up the market, it restricted the U.S. registry to ships built in the United States. Many say that the U.S. was preoccupied with internal development during this period, and this was the reason for decline in the shipping industry. To us, that sounds more like an excuse than a reason. The U.S. was not competitive. The Morrill Act didn't make the U.S. competitive. By 1900, U.S. tonnage was at the 1807 level, and ships of U.S. registry moved only 9% of U.S. foreign trade. By the turn of the 20th century, the U.S. acquired some colonial interests and a taste for world power. A symbol was the around-the-world trip of the Great White Fleet of 1908, which brought the U.S. maritime situation in focus. For logistics, the fleet had to be followed by a ragtag collection of foreign flag trampers. The Navy had long been concerned about logistics dependence on foreign flag vessels. The Cargo Preference Act of 1904 had already begun to respond to that concern. It required that military goods shipped overseas be carried on U.S. ships. To help enlarge the fleet, the Panama Canal Act of 1912 allowed the registry of foreign-built vessels, and it enlarged the market by extending cabotage, the exclusive right to navigate in coastal waters, to Hawaii and to the Philippines. The Siemens Act of 1915 required U.S. crews on ships of U.S. registry. These were efforts to enlarge and control a fleet of vessels, but their impact was not great. The United States Shipping Board was established in 1916 at the advent of World War I to coordinate the logistics of the U.S. Merchant Marine. When the U.S. entered the war, the board acted with vigor. The main result was a large U.S. fleet at the end of a war which saw 470 ships completed. Another 1,300 were delivered in the four subsequent years. All flew the U.S. flag, and the U.S. fleet followed only the merchant fleet with the United Kingdom in size. The act also endorsed the participation of U.S. carriers in open conferences to set rates, that is, participate in the maritime rate setting in the style of rail tariff bureaus. This was a murky area before. The European carriers had established conferences in the Atlantic at about 1875. Because antitrust laws were established and enforced in the United States, the participation by U.S. carriers was at question, an open conflict is one that publishes rates and permits anyone to join. The act also allowed transfer of shipping board ships to foreign registry, Panama at first and then Honduras. The reason was to encourage neutral flag carriers during wartime. The Jones Act of 1920 required U.S. flagged vessels built in the United States for internal U.S. commerce and disposed of the shipping board and its ships. The ships were sold at near scrap prices. This law thus endorsed the principle of cabotage. With the disposal of the fleet, the U.S. maritime activities slumped. The slump set off half-hearted debates and it yielded the 1928 Act, which reestablished the mail subsidy and made available construction loans for shipbuilding.
However, for international trade, U.S. flagged vessels need not be built in the United States. There was division of domestic shipping into intercoastal trade from east to west coast and coastwise trade along either the Atlantic or Pacific coasts, but not between them. Clearly, domestic U.S. shipping dropped significantly over the 20th century as rail and especially trucking soared. Intercoastal vessels declined from 165 in 1939 to 57 in 1954. Coastwise vessels from 543 to 283 in the same period. Since rarely were ports the final destination, shorter distance trips by trucks could reduce handling costs, even in the more efficient container era. Rail improved to handle most longer distance shipments. Petroleum tankers were the vast majority of coastwise trade by 1954. The Great Depression reduced international trade and things drifted along until the 1936 Merchant Marine Act established the U.S. Maritime Commission to develop standardized specifications for new ships. As with the PCC streetcar, consumers demanded standardized vehicles from producers to lower costs. The U.S. Maritime Commission also established essential trade routes and assigning services and establishing wage and manning requirements for ships. The Act canceled mail subsidies and established construction differential subsidies, CDS, and operational differential subsidies, ODS. The CDS ranged from 35 to 50 percent and made low-cost loans available. The subsidy was only available if approved by the U.S. Navy and the ships constructed were in the essential naval reserve. The ODS had no limit placed on them except that ships had to be less than 20 years of age and operated in the foreign trades. These subsidies began to rebuild the U.S. fleet modestly and by 1941, the U.S. fleet had about 16% of world tonnage. The U.S. emerged from World War II with 60% of the world's tonnage. By 1948, Merchant Ship Sales Act was passed to dispose of the tonnage, and by 1950, the U.S. fleet was reduced to 36% of world tonnage. The industry was heavily regulated. After a lot of paperwork and time, the Interstate Commerce Commission issued certificates of convenience before service could be provided. Only trade internal to companies, for example, an oil company with its own fleet, would have flexibility on pricing and service. Policy at the beginning of World War II was to build easily assembled, inexpensive, and rather slow sailing ships, for example, Liberty ships. But some analysis soon showed payoffs from improved technology tankers, also termed tank ships, and other new models that were placed in production and began accumulating in the fleet. Many older ships were scrapped, and these newer ships, purchased especially by U.S. and European operators, formed the basis of the post-World War II fleets. But although not generally recognized at first, there was still room for technological change. In part, this was scale up in form, especially for tankers. Tankers ranged from 16,000 DWT T2 to upwards of 600,000 DWTs. Tankers larger than 160,000 DWTs are termed very large crude carriers, VLCCF. But although not generally recognized at first, there was still room for technological change. In part, this was scale up in form, especially for tankers. Tankers ranged from 16,000 deadweight tonnage, DWT, T2 ships, to upwards of 600,000 DWT. Tankers larger than 160,000 deadweight tonnage are termed very large crude carriers, VLCCS. Most are in the size of range of 250,000 to 450,000 DWT. Modern designs have bridge aft and use a single screw and rudder. While the figure shows the domestic fleet, some say the real fleet is the effective U.S. control fleet, EUSC. Ships registered with Liberia, Panama, Honduras, the Bahamas, and the Marshall Islands are often considered part of the EUSC fleet and simply registered with these flags of convenience. These ships are generally owned by U.S. citizens or corporations and are subject to requisition. The EUSC concept originated prior to World War II to avoid the Neutrality Act as a way to provide materiel to Great Britain. Most of the ships are crewed by non-U.S. citizens and thus seizing the ships will not result in gaining the crews. The principle that sailors were not to be pressed into service was established by the War of 1812. The EUSC fleet defined as above, 7,927 ships, is about 18 times the size of the flag fleet, 443 ships, and constitutes about 28% of the world's fleet, 28,296 ships at the time. The Maritime Administration encouraged development of the EUSC in the late 1940s by allowing World War II ships to be transferred to foreign flags in order to encourage new work for American shipyards. These ships were transferred with the agreement of the Defense Department. They could be recalled if needed. In 
Some effective control was maintained then, but effective control of today's EUSC fleet is a fiction. Many of the ships are tank ships and are too large to call it U.S. ports. Yet during the Gulf War of 1990 to 1991, many tankers switched to a U.S. flag to ensure the protection of the U.S. military. As we will see in Chapter 19, the adoption of sensors, communications, and computers, along with containerization, has yielded sharp reductions in the labor required as well as advances in ship routing and scheduling. Armed with technical know-how, one would think the U.S. fleet gained from these developments. One would think that the U.S. fleet could have been a contender for world trade. Instead, the U.S. has, on world comparison, a small fleet. We do not have a good answer to the question of the lack of U.S. comparative advantage. Discussions we hear stress the low cost of buying and using World War II ships. That was a bargain for the devil for Western European and American operators. Other nations without their ships adopted new technology forms to produce competitive ships, and that eventually gave them a lead. The tank ships were the first ships to scale up, and shipyards building those gained technology experience. We also hear that the U.S. shipbuilding industry is too Navy-oriented, both in technology and contracting. The debate continues about the fiscal aids government gives sea trade, not Jones Act, shipbuilders and operators, and it is argued that these aids are counterproductive. Construction differential subsidies through its ties to the naval interests overemphasize the break bulk cargo liner, and the operational differential subsidies blunted operators' searches for efficient ship and ship operations. To avoid the special U.S. conditions on registry, some large operators have extensively used flags of convenience. Today, the Liberian flag is widely used. To try to turn this situation around, 1970 legislation extended the construction and operating subsidies to non-liner ships, and the CDS was increased to 50%. 1984 legislation allowed liner service to inland points using contracts with other modes. That advantage is available to all liner operators, of course, but one cannot blame the situation entirely on subsidies. Issues of regulation and protectionism remain within the global ocean freight industry, as in international air travel. While it is one thing for a government to let domestic firms compete for domestic trade unfettered, at least all of the gains stay national, it is another to allow unregulated international flows. Ships from most countries can carry U.S. trade to other countries. In that sense, trade is already deregulated. But there are periodic pressures to support the domestic shipping or shipbuilding industries to impose some sort of protectionist measures, such as cargo reservation, to reserve a certain fraction of cargo for U.S. flagged ships. Other countries do similar things to a greater or lesser extent. With respect to the vitality of the U.S. fleet and construction industry, one impression we have is that we ought to let things run their course. It has been said that U.S. bottoms are more expensive because of mandated safety features, and they are more expensive to operate because of high labor costs. But as other nations develop, labor costs and requirements for safety go up. One can make similar comments about shipbuilding. The problem with that view is that the cost differences are bound to be around for a long time, and the U.S. fleet and shipbuilding would disappear if there were no construction and operating cost subsidies. At best, we would end up with a U.S.-owned foreign flag fleet, as we have in the bulk trades. But that's a risk. The defense sector wouldn't accept that risk because they wouldn't have an effective U.S.-controlled EUSC resource. They wouldn't have the shipyards either. An option would be to continue policies now in force, make them stronger, and put more money behind them.